Good morning. Can you hear me okay? It's good to see everyone here today. What a beautiful baptism. And I had the privilege of embracing Yocasta first. And I want to tell you that was a genuine embrace. She was truly full of joy. And friends, I just want to share with you, this is what Jesus does to us. He comes into our lives, he changes us, he moves us. And I just thank God for this opportunity that we have to witness someone who has come to faith in the Messiah. We're in a sermon series that we started a few weeks ago. It's entitled, I am not the same how Jesus reshapes me. In fact, we have these flyers that we've been handing out. Uh, these are flyers that we can invite friends and family to. And you can also use this for the schedule. And you can see the lineup. Uh, next week is Bartimaeus. The following week is Matthew, Thomas, and then we'll end on Mother's Day with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the scriptures are here as well. Uh, there's another flyer I just got on the way up here, or before, I, uh, before we shared or before the baptism. There is a new series starting. Have you heard of this? Called The Hopeful, put out by Hope Channel. It's a, modern, a modernized story of a group of Advent believers in the mid-1800s. And this is the story of how that movement started. So it's going to show up. It's going to start showing this Wednesday. Uh, I believe that there's some flyers in the back. You're welcome to, to grab a flyer uh, for your enjoyment and check it out this Wednesday. The series that we're, we're, we're in is called I'm Not the Same, How Jesus Reshapes Me. And what we're, we're, we're realizing as we journey through this teaching is that we are all being shaped by something or some kind of stimuli. Whether it's the news, some type of data, uh, a food or substance that I put into my body, the people that I hang around with, we are all being shaped. Let me illustrate it this way. Do you know what happened on Monday afternoon this past week? What happened this Monday afternoon? Solar eclipse. Did we have any brave people here who went down to Indiana? Okay, there were some brave people here who went all the way down to Indiana. And how long was that, that total eclipse when it was completely dark? How long was that period? About three minutes. Was it worth it? All right. Was it worth sitting in traffic on the way back? <laughs> I don't like traffic. The next solar eclipse is, what, 18 years from now or 20 years from now? So I'll try to go down maybe 20 years from now. Uh, we'll, 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 try to, we'll try to see it. Now, I don't, it, don't try this at home. My daughter, Eliana, with her kindergarten class, they had these special glasses. Did any of you have those special glasses to see? Because if you don't have those glasses and you look at the sun, what happens to your eyes? Yeah. What I tried to do was just go, just quickly look at the sun just to warm up my eyes and see. And I don't recommend that, but I just tried it to see what would happen. And that object, that burning object of the sun, stayed with my eyes as I looked left and right, looked at the bushes. The image stays, right? I don't, now kids, don't try this at home. But when I beheld the sun, the image stayed in my mind. It, it shaped my perception. The things that we behold... These things shape how we see, and it shapes who we are. There's an author and a speaker by the name of John Mark Comer. One of our elders here, Uncle Bing Alabada, he shared this book that he wrote about being unhurried. And thank you, Uncle, Uncle Bing. I love this speaker and his writing, his book I just read called Live No Lies. If you have not read that book, I'd recommend that you get that book. It's an amazing book, Live No Lies. And in his book, Live No Lies, he speaks about the, the different stimuli in our culture today that shapes who we are. And he talks about Hollywood, and, and he's, he admits that he grew up in a very fundamentalist home, uh, and he said it was very conservative, and it was, it, it, there were parts of it that were not helpful, but he shares that this is what was helpful. And he shares this about Hollywood and about those, the very things that shape us. He said in his book, Live No Lies, page 92, while I'm not saying, while I am not saying we need to boycott Hollywood, I am saying that everything we allow into our minds has an effect on our souls, for good or for evil. If you don't believe me, go do a little research on neurobiology. 
specifically how what we see affects our mirror neurons and how thoughts enter the mind, creating neural pathways in our brains, which create DNA proteins in our nervous system, which are then disseminated throughout our bodies and become part of us, and some argue are in turn passed on to our children in their genetic code. And then he says, synopsis, what we give our attention to will shape the persons that we become. What we think about, we become, he says. And he quoted this one author, Hui Hui Tan. She, this person put it, that's the profound truth. You are what your mind looks at. You are what you contemplate. We are what we contemplate. Now that's a very potent and powerful statement. We are what we contemplate. Just think about the majority or the, the most pressing thoughts that surfaced in your mind this past week. I am what I contemplate. The stories and the justifications of, oh yeah, I should have done that, 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 that person deserved this, or my coworker, yeah, let, that, this is why I said this. We run these narratives in our mind, and according to uh, John Mark Homer, and I think it's a biblical principle, we are what we contemplate. And this morning, I'd like to encourage us to contemplate a theme which I think will really resonate with a lot of us here. It's this theme of God's limitless acceptance of us. And that's what we're going to contemplate in the story this morning. And I hope that as we contemplate on this well-known story that many of us know, that this will begin to detach you from the illusions of what you think is really making you happy and will begin to attach you to the very source that will bring your soul and your heart and your mind freedom, happiness, and joy. Let's pray before we open the scripture together. Father, we come to you. We sit in silence. We long to hear Jesus speak. So shape us through scripture. Shape us through this story. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Ten verses. It's in your bulletin. You're welcome to turn in your Bible if you have one. If you don't, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. If you don't have a physical Bible, you can use your digital one on your tablet or on your smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, God bless you. Look onto your neighbor's Bible. We're in Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. I'm in the New International Version. Let me share some background before we jump into verse 1. Jesus, he's the main character of the Gospels. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He knows his fate is just around the corner. On his way to Jerusalem, he wants to pass by Jericho. And he, as he approaches Jericho, he encounters a blind beggar. And you can read about this in Luke 18, verses 35 through 43. But that's not our passage. I'm just setting, a, setting the background for today. Jesus works a miracle. He restores this blind, blind man's sight. He could not see for many years, for decades. And now the seeing man, once blind, but now he sees. He jumps up and down and yells, I can see, I can see, and gives God all the glory. I can't help but think of the lyrics of that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Um, I am blind, but now I see. So he can see. He looks up to heaven and says, glory be to God and glory be to, to, to the Lord, the, the miracle worker. And then the crowd here uh, outside of Jericho, they join the seeing man and everyone cries out. Did you just see what happened? Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. And as Jesus, he knows he's going to Jerusalem because his, the end of his life is approaching. But then he passes through a town by the name of Jericho, which we learn about in verse 1. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. 
Now, many of us, when we read that verse in verse 1, we might think that, you know, Jericho is just a quick pit stop. It's a quick rest area, an unimportant rest area, so that Jesus can finally get to his real destination, which is Jerusalem. But one thing I know about Jesus is that he is intentional and he is thoughtful. He has intention behind every move and behind every, behind every single conversation. And Jesus is stopping in Jericho for a specific reason. He wants, to, he wants to teach people a lesson about his love and his acceptance. Some people believe that this story is part of a larger section that has sometimes been called the gospel to the outcast. In this section, before he gets into Jerusalem, He's reminding people that the good news is not for just the good people within the synagogue and church. It is for people who are deemed outcasts in society. And we're going to see how much Jesus loves and accepts outcasts. God's umbrella, friends, let me just share this with you. God's umbrella is large enough for outcasts. It's large enough for outcasts. You don't believe me? Look at verse 2. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus, right? I just thought of the song, oh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, right? That's Zacchaeus. The song just came to my mind right now. Little wee little man. Was he a good man? Zacchaeus was a bad man. Tax collectors were despised in Israel. They hated them. Most people thought that tax collectors were extortionists. Do you know what an extortionist is? An extortionist is a person who tries to obtain something through force or violence. Jewish society also believed that tax collectors were partners with the Romans. Ah, those tax collectors, those are the scum of the earth. How dare they try to partner with these Roman, pagan Romans? The Jewish people, the, 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 the Israelite society believed that tax collectors were thieves. They thought that they were outcasts. Those tax collectors, that Zacchaeus man, he is a reject and an outcast. And notice that Zacchaeus is not just a normal tax collector. collector. The, the text, uh, Luke writes here in verse 2, that Zacchaeus is a thief, a chief outcast. He's a chief tax collector. The people really hated him because not only was he a tax collector, he managed and oversaw a, a, a team of tax collectors. I mean, you talk about someone who was a social reject. He was the worst of the worst. Zacchaeus was the ultimate of Israel's outcasts, and people think of Zacchaeus like they do of Adolf Hitler. That's a name that, that people in much of society do not enjoy hearing. People think of Zacchaeus like they do of Adolf Hitler. He was a despicable man who did atrocious things. He was the epitome of a social outcast. Zacchaeus had been hearing about this popular teacher named Jesus. And Jesus enters Zacchaeus' hometown. A large crowd gathers around Jesus. And we pick up the story now in verse 3. He, Zacchaeus, wanted to see Jesus, who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Verse 4. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. You know, I find it interesting that Luke, the author of this gospel, describes Zacchaeus as short and that he climbs up. He's short and he climbs up. This sounds like the American dream, right? The, the major narrative that is really popular in America today, the American dream. I was short on cash. I climbed up and worked hard. And look, I've reached the top. And just when you think that the American success story only exists here in America, you might want to think again. One of the primary narratives, okay, I'm going to give you a term uh, can you say the term meta-narrative? Okay, meta-narrative. It's another way of saying a big, grand, a grand story, a meta-narrative, a primary narrative. 
a grand story in our culture today, in American culture, is uh, the rags to riches story. Everyone loves a good rags to riches story, right? I was short, I didn't have much cash, but I climbed up and I worked hard, and now look where I am today. I'm in a position of leadership and influence. We see this storyline, this meta-narrative, this grand story in many uh, social media influencers today. Nothing wrong with it, I'm just stating the fact. I had 10 subscribers on YouTube, I worked really hard, and I posted two, three times a day, and they was, this was catchy content, uh, and, and I happened to also be good looking, which will sell better, right? And now I'm at the top, so I was low, I work hard, now I'm at the top. We see this, this storyline, this grand narrative, this grand story, and every good sports story. Who is the best three-point shooter, in the words of Stephen A. Smith, that God has ever created? You don't know. Okay, Stephen Curry, okay, he plays for the Golden State Warriors. He broke the three-point record last year in Madison Square Garden. He was a nobody, right? Uh, uh, scouts would say he's too small, too weak, he's not fast enough. He was low. He was short in status. He worked hard. He had grit, and then he reached the top. He became the best three-point shooter ever. We see this main, this meta-narrative or this grand story in the immigrant story, which many of us can relate to, we, we had nothing in the country, in the country, in the, in, in, and back home in my country. But now, for economic means, I had nothing. And, if, and I worked hard, and through my hard work, and through my education, and through my, my grit, I now have economic success that I can send back home to my family and to my relatives who need it. Friends, there's nothing wrong with a rags to riches story. There's nothing wrong with a good success story. Human beings, we love a good rags to riches story. But do you know what I find ironic? There, there, there aren't many people who are asking, are riches really making me happy? Are riches really making me happy? I have seen, especially maybe in the immigrant story of those who have come, who work, who worked hard to provide a better future for their immediate family, their an extended family. And I have seen where that work ethic became their life, and it completely consumed them. And could it be that while our rags to riches story is good, could it be that riches can leave us feeling like rags? Is there something more to life than climbing the ladder to material prosperity? I will always be thankful to my parents who decided in the late 70s to come to this country with a strong and robust middle class here in America. I will always be thankful for that. I will always be grateful. I do wonder though, is, this, is there something more to life than establishing material prosperity? Are matters of the soul more important than success? I believe so, and that's what we're learning from this man, Zacchaeus. This short man climbed the success tree, unfortunately through inappropriate means, but found that prosperity actually made him feel short. But now this short man, Zacchaeus, he climbs a sycamore tree to find a person, not prosperity, but a person. Perhaps this person will give him the, reach, the riches that his heart has always been looking for. And the story continues in verse 5. The text reads here, Luke wrote, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Wow. Friends, I don't know about you, but I find these verses so powerfully healing. Jesus says, come down immediately, Zacchaeus. It's an urgent command to hang out. That's what Jesus wanted to do with Zacchaeus. Let's hang out. I remember when I was a teenager, didn't know what to do, just hanging out in my house. Then all of a sudden, I would get a text from my friend. I grew up in the city of Chicago. Hey, let's go to Old Orchard Mall in Skokie, I think. Yeah, it's in Skokie, Illinois. And I'm like, cool. I'm hanging out. I'm all alone, but my friends want to hang out with me. It feels really good when other people invite us to hang out with them. The words, I must stay at your house today, means, in today's language, I want to hang out with you. 
Jesus is saying to the Zacchaeuses of the world, I want to be with you. And who would want to reject this invitation? I mean, this is Jesus, friends. This is the teacher. This is the healer. This is the miracle worker. This is the Messiah. The entire corpus, the entire body of Scripture is presenting a God, a being who wants to hang out with me. This is the main character of this storybook, a God who wants to hang out with me. And to those of you who have felt emotionally abandoned by your loved ones, maybe your friends, maybe your family, Jesus reminds you and he reminds me today, he reminds us that he has always been there and he wants to be present and hang out with us. And Jesus' command was so incredibly healing to Zac Zacchaeus. Look what, wrote, look what uh, Luke wrote in verses 6 and 7. Of course Zacchaeus would respond because the text says here in verse 6, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Really? Me? Sure. Verse 7, all the people saw this and they began to mutter, right? They call this chismis. Hey, 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 he has gone to be a guest of a sinner, right? Gossip. It doesn't exist in our culture. Gossip, right? Chismis. This short manager of, a of tax collectors joyfully welcomes Jesus to his home. Zacchaeus is so glad that this renowned teacher accepts him. He wants to spend time with him. He is so thrilled because, because, because Jesus wants to spend time with him. But Zacchaeus does not feel accepted by the community. They whisper, can you believe this? Jesus is hanging out with this low-life sinner. No good. No good. Why did they label Zac Zacchaeus a sinner in verse 7? Why did they name him that? Well, they seem quite judgmental. Well, in order to understand why they called him sinner, I mean, I wouldn't recommend that you go around to the mall and start calling people sinner. Right? That's just not, you don't do that today, right? But we have to understand their background. A lot of people back then, especially the religious leaders, viewed a person's worth by their morality. In other words, the better you were at being a good and moral person and keeping God's law and the laws of the land, the better your social approval. If you were a really bad, immoral person, you lost a lot of social approval points. Sorry, you lost it. Zacchaeus is as low as you can get. He's not only a tax collector, he's a director of other low-life tax collectors. And so many, many Jewish people were allergic to the mere presence of Zacchaeus. Who is this man trying to climb up a tree? He's despicable. In fact, some historians say this, table fellowship, to eat at the table uh, with these kind of people carried great social significance in the ancient world for a religious-minded Pharisee, a religious leader, to eat with a notorious sinner brought ceremonial defilement and social ostracism. It would be like me, a pastor, a leader, sitting down with a sinner, a quote-unquote sinner like Zacchaeus, and and, 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 then, and then saying, how could you eat with that reject? By you eating with that reject, you too have become a reject, Nestor. You see, your friends, your family and community would reject you if you ate with a horrible sinner like Zacchaeus. But Jesus does not care about labels. Can I share that? Let me share that again. The Messiah does not care about labels. I don't think you heard me. The Son of God does not care about labels. He cares more about you than your past record. He cares about your being than your bad behavior. He cares about the person behind the behavior. When Jesus sees you, he does not see a failure. He accepts you for who you are, not what you have done. I'll say that again. Jesus accepts you for who you are, not what you have done. God's acceptance is extravagant. Now, what does the word extravagant mean? The word extravagant means limitless. The picture that comes into my mind when I think of extravagant was in, I think it was 2007, I went to my friend's wedding at the Drake Hotel in downtown Chicago. Has anyone been to the Drake? Have you been to a wedding ceremony and reception in the Drake? I kid you not, 
That wedding was at least eighty to one hundred thousand dollars. It was decked out. I mean, I, I did a lot of singing back then with friends. We sang a special song for that wedding, and I could not believe the majestic beauty and the extravagant beauty of the decoration and, and the setting, the decor of the Drake Hotel, that reception room. That's what I think of when I think of the word extravagant. Whoa, this is otherworldly. This is, I'm speechless. God's acceptance is extravagant. It's over the top. And there are some people here who have been burdened under the weight of guilt from your social circle or even from yourself. Perhaps someone has been reminding you about how bad you are. Or perhaps you have been reminding yourself of how bad you are. And I am aware that there are some personalities that have more of an a, a inclination toward sensitivity, maybe toward guilt, and maybe toward depression. There are some personalities like that. When we see all of the beautiful and airbrushed people on magazine stands and social media, you know what we think? I will never even look half as good as Taylor Swift. And why did I mention her? Because I was at Jewel Osco this week, and guess who showed up on the magazine rack? Taylor Swift, right? She's the epitome of beauty in society today. And she's made billions from her songs. When we see that, we're like... I'm not airbrushed and not as good looking. I'm a reject. How can we feel accepted in a culture that celebrates charm instead of character? It celebrates the exterior instead of the interior. Celebrates the surface instead of the soul. And how can I feel accepted in a community when I have failed over and over and over and over again? I can't stop. You might be thinking, I'm at, I can't stop this addiction. I can't stop this pornography addiction. I cannot stop this alcohol addiction. I cannot stop this social media addiction. You know what? I can't stop this judgmental addiction. It, has, it is wreaking havoc in my heart and my soul. And to those of us who feel like rejects and outcasts, Jesus reminds us that he accepts us. And friends, just in case you forgot, Jesus accepts you. God's acceptance is extravagant. And look what God's extravagant acceptance does in this man. Let's read the first part of Luke chapter 19 now in verse 8. Remember, Zacchaeus welcomes him home, welcomes him to his house. They're hanging out. They're eating. They're chilling. Verse 8, but Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, and here's his announcement to the Lord and those who were there. Look, Lord. Here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. I give half of my possessions to the poor. You know what that's called? It's called almsgiving. Do you know what almsgiving is? Almsgiving is the practice of giving money or food to the poor, right? This is a practice then. It was a custom. It was a sign of how great of a religious person you were in Jewish culture, a few Bible commentaries, commentators say this, rabbis or teachers considered it unwise to give away more than 20% of one's goods, lest one become a burden to others. Zacchaeus takes the radical step of giving away half. He doesn't just give the minimum requirement 20%. He gives half of his possessions. You see, God's extravagant acceptance ignites extravagant goodness. God's extravagant, otherworldly acceptance ignites extravagant goodness in Zacchaeus. When we encounter the Messiah, I will not rem remain the same. That's the whole premise of this teaching series. I'm not the same how Jesus reshapes me. Every individual that encountered and met the Messiah was changed and reshaped. They, Zacchaeus encountered and experienced the unconditional extravagant acceptance of God as a social reject, and that ignited in him a passion, an inspiration to do extravagant good deeds. And the text continues in verse, in verse 8, the second part. Well, let's start in the beginning. Look, Lord, here, and now I give half of my positions to the poor. And here's the second part. 
and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back how many times? Four times the amount. In the Old Testament, a few hundred thousand years before the time of Jesus, the Old Testament had a rule. If you stole money, you would have to return the money and add 20% 20 to the value that was lost. All right, so put your math hats on. I'm going to ask you some math questions. So let's say that you stole $1,000 from someone. Okay, this is Old Testament times. And now you got caught and you feel guilty. And you're like, okay, you return the 1000 but then you would add 20% of the 1000 that you give back. And how much is that? Yes, A plus for all of you. You give back $200, 20% on top of the 1000 So when you, you stole one thousand. Uh, you stole $1,000, you have to give back $1,200. You, you, you stole a, the 100 now turns into 120 It's actually profit for the person that was the victim of your thievery or your robbery. Later on, a lot of Jewish leaders, they softened the penalty, and they said, give back the value equivalent to the loss. Okay, so if you stole $1,000, I think... Around the time of Jesus, there was an expectation, well, you have to give back the $1,000. So before, it was 120%. Now, it's 100%. You took 1000 you give back 1000 Zacchaeus exceeds the laws of restitution. He admits that he is a thief and that he has stolen a lot of money and goods from good, innocent people. And he says that he would pay back, not 100%. Not 120%. How much? 400% of what he, he stole. So for every $1,000 that he stole from someone, he would give back $4,000. You see what happens. It, what's happening in Zacchaeus' heart. Zacchaeus doesn't do what is minimally required of justice. Zacchaeus exceeds the minimum requirement of justice and goodness. Because God's extravagant acceptance ignites within us an extravagant goodness that not only meets the demands of justice, but surpasses justice. That's what happens when you and I meet and encounter the Messiah. We are, is like standing under, I haven't been there yet, but I want to, it's like standing under the Niagara Falls and experiencing the unconditional extravagant acceptance and unconditional love like a waterfall that falls upon you that refreshes you on a hot, smoldering day. And it works in, in your heart. And you say, this is so refreshing and so amazing. I can't wait to tell everyone about this. I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell everyone. I'm going to sacrifice even my... my uh, my, uh, I'm going to get awkward and just tell people about Messiah because I've been so refreshed by the Niagara Fall-like mercy and acceptance of Jesus. When you and I experience the unconditional and lavish acceptance of Jesus, you will, we will practice and do good things that are beyond our expectations. For example, let's say that you're having a hard time right now, and some of you are. You have an enemy in your life. It could be someone that you're living with at home. It could be your spouse. It could be a friend. It could be a, a, a bully at school. It could be that, that co-worker. You know, you know what I'm talking about? That co-worker? You know, the, that co-worker. Yes, the one that you don't really want to talk to at work. Or that neighbor. You know, that, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? That neighbor. You know who it is, right? You may be having a hard time loving your enemy, but, but l- let, me, let me ask you this. What would happen if we would consider the reality that God's extravagant acceptance ignites extravagant goodness, that could it be that the person that I deem an enemy or I label an outcast, whether it's a difference of a political party or a difference of uh, even a Christian denomination, could it be that that person whom I label an outcast is still extravagantly accepted by the Messiah? And if, it's, if that's true, could I, could I not within my own heart find within my own heart and the resources of my own soul the ability to forgive someone like that? You might be having a hard time making some time for making time each day for God. And friends, trust me, this is hard. 
in a culture that worships speed. And being in a capitalistic society where goods and services are exchanged for money, where profit is the king and the grand purpose of the larger meta-narrative meta story or the larger grand story of society, speed, speed, speed. Get as much as, as, much as I can. Speed, speed, speed. Uh, get the kids ready for school, feed them breakfast, pack their lunch. Drive them to school, make sure you're not late. Drop them off at school, go to work. Go to work, uh, uh, work quick because I have a meeting coming up soon. Finish meeting, pick up the kids, cook supper. Speed, 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 speed. When's the last time that we've stopped and had silence and solitude? And I'm becoming more convinced that the church is that place to remind the production centered society that life is grander than production and prosperity that stopping once a week in a corporate gathering like this and then stopping daily in my time you know if I can give 20 30 minutes to watch NBA highlights and Steph Curry watch threes I think I could give I'm talking to myself I can give 30 minutes I can give 45 minutes to stop and to stay, to, stay, to stay silent before a God who loves me unconditionally. And what if we sat silently before God's extravagant acceptance and love? Don't you think that would ignite within us an extravagant goodness? I believe so. I believe so. I believe it with all my heart. Let me share with you a, a few things of our, our visioning team journey, and then we'll, we'll land this plane. So, we as a congregation have been on this journey with a visioning team that you elected last year, March. And uh, what the visioning team has decided as we're figuring out where are we going as a church in the next three to five years. We said, hey, before we get into a strategic vision of what we should do, we were, we were awestruck uh, last August in a meeting realizing, you guys, we're starting with ourselves. We're not actually starting with God. And so what we did was we shifted our strategy and said, instead of trying to figure out what we should be doing to help God, we should be asking, well, what is God up to and what is he doing? And so what we're doing is we're starting with the theological vision. We as an elder team wrestled with this. Thank you, elders. It was a great conversation. And there was conflict, good conflict. And I was telling, I was telling someone recently that healthy conflict is the first step toward cohesion. You need to have good debate, good healthy conflict, okay? And as you were reading that, uh, reading last week, one line that we read at the end was this line, uh, in summary, because we're trying to figure out who is God, okay? Uh, in summary, who is God? God is love. What is his mission? His mission is to be reconciled with us so that we can be with him forever. And then we wrote, we wrote down here in the last two sentences, in other words, what is the purpose for the Hinsdale Philam Church's existence? And one line, and it's, this is not set in stone, this is... This is, this is malleable, but one line based on our study is this. The purpose for our existence is to join God in his mission of reconciling all people to himself. And that's what God is up to. What is he doing? God is working behind the scenes to get your attention. He's working behind the scenes even outside of this gathering and outside of, outside of the time of your personal worship to get your attention, to draw you to himself. And he will use whatever means, including church and spiritual leaders, to get your attention to tell you that he loves you unconditionally. That's what he's doing. And so what the visioning team is proposing, based on our construct and summary of our study of scripture, is that God is in the business of, we're, we, we want to join God in that business. And, and then, so we, we don't even have a section here about the mission of the church. We're going we're gonna to come, come down to that soon. But I read in this book uh, by John Stott called Christian Mission in the, the Modern World. And he says that the mission comes down to two things. What's the purpose of the church's existence and your existence as a believer in the Messiah? It's to save and to serve. It's to evangelize and to care. It's to um, lead people to Jesus and to care people on Jesus' Jesus behalf. It's to save the least of these and it's to serve the least of these. But here's my question. What is the fuel for our mission? What is the fuel that's going to drive that? 
can I just give you a sneak peek? And we'll reveal this to you in a few months as we, we uh, edit this. Can I just give you a sneak peek what that fuel is? Here it is. Here's the fuel. Based on the gospel. We can draw several conclusions based on this word study on the gospel, the word gospel. First, since the gospel is God's good news and not ours, the object of our faith is God and not us. Second, the gospel is not something that we do, a way of life, but it is something to be proclaimed and announced, which affects what we do. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, or the Septuagint, the word euangelizo, proclaim good news, appears over 20 times. In Psalm 40, verse 9, it is illustrative. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. The good news is God's good news of deliverance, but what are we delivered and rescued from? We are rescued from God's wrath against sin, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Since sin can be defined as the violation of God's laws, but sin is something deeper, we outwardly rebel against God's laws because we are inwardly rebellious against God. And so, how would God deliver us from this condemnation? He would send Jesus because he loves us unconditionally, right? Extravagant acceptance. God sent his son Jesus to be condemned for our sin on the cross so that we can have peace with God and be reconciled with him, John 3, 16. In the Bible, the act of reconciliation, salvation, is something that God always initiates and is the apex of God's work of reconciliation. It's his work. The apex of his work of reconciliation is what Jesus did on the cross, The gospel is not so much something that we need to do, but it is the proclamation that God has achieved salvation already in Jesus. The gospel then is not a way of life, although it leads to a radical change in our lives. And this is the story of Zacchaeus. And at the end here in our writing here, unlike every religion and worldview, whether you're religious or irreligious, in the business world, at your work, in school, Every worldview says you need to do something in order to be accepted. The gospel says God did everything so that you can be accepted. Thus, unlike the religious or irreligious person, the Christian's motivation for work is not motivated by duty. Man, I have to so that I can finally be saved. Rather, for the believer, the Christian doesn't start with duty. They actually start with delight. And guess what? Zacchaeus did not start with duty. In fact, he told a lot, a lot of people told him, you better, you better shape up, Zacchaeus, and stop stealing people. Did that change his life? No. But when he encountered extravagant, unconditional love and acceptance from the Messiah, guess what? It ignited a fire, a blazing fire of extravagant goodness in his heart. And what would happen to a church community? What will happen to our community? Can you imagine what will happen when we understand and experience and heal and believe that we are extravagantly accepted by God? Can you imagine a community that is rooted in Jesus and the gospel which says that I am unconditionally loved, accepted by Jesus? So what what doesn't primarily drive us is we need greater goals of reaching the community. That's great. But it is not... Goals that drive our community, it is the gospel and God that drives our community. And when we're rooted in that, I promise you, because this is what happened in Zacchaeus' life, that when you and I experience the delightful, flavorful, tasty, sweet, unconditional, extravagant love and acceptance of Jesus, it will create in my heart, in our hearts, a desire to exceed the justice that we see in our community. And guess what? The social organizations in, around our community, we love, we, we want to partner with them. But what would happen to a community that's rooted in unconditional love like this? I can only imagine, guys, that the sky is the limit. The sky is the limit because God's extravagant acceptance will ignite extravagant goodness in our hearts. And yeah, you know what? It's going to happen. It can happen in this community. We're divided. Yep. We are broken. Yeah. We're, are we imperfect? Yep. Are we impatient? Yes. Are we divided? Are we opinionated? Of course. If you don't believe us, go to our elders meeting. We're opinionated. It's okay to have opinions. We are a struggling community of believers trying to make sense of the Messiah. But if we root ourselves in the Messiah, what happens? We will exceed, as a community, our capacity of doing good for others in our homes, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our families, 
in our neighborhoods, in our local geographic community. I'm talking about an actual impact in people who live within a three to five mile radius of this local church. I think that's what's going to happen if we root ourselves in the Messiah. Let's read these last two verses of 9 and 10, and then we'll read verses 5 and 6, and then we're done. Look what Jesus said in verse 9. Jesus said to him, Okay, Zacchaeus, you just gave away all this. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is what? He's a son of Abraham. The Jewish people were very proud that they were of the lineage of Abraham. And do you know what Jesus is saying here? That this reject who you've called a social outcast, this person's the son of Abraham. You know why? Because not tomorrow, but today he has saved. And here's my question, friends. Was his salvation, was Zacchaeus' salvation based on his status? Do you know where his salvation was based? Verse 10, not his status, for the Son of Man. His salvation was rooted not in his status, but it was rooted in the Son of Man. That's how he could say, today I am saved. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. How much would you go seeking if you lost your phone? What if you lost your charging brick for your computer? Last Tuesday, this past Tuesday, at the Hinsdale Public Library, I like to go there to do deep work and to work on my sermons and other work. I was in a rush to pick up the kids at school. And uh, it wasn't until Thursday that I realized that my charging brick was not in my backpack. And I said, oh, man, where did it go? Where's my charging brick? And so then on Thursday, I went back to the library, and I went to the receptionist, and I asked the receptionist, hey, did you see a charging brick? So she pulled out a box. This is on Thursday. And the box had, it said small, small appliances, and they had a little Mac, you know, iPhone charger and a cord. And I said, that's not it. And I said, does all lost and found come to this desk? Yes. Well, I didn't, I didn't really believe her. I wanted to keep looking because I wanted to seek and find my charger, my charging brick. And so then I went to the backside where I was, and I asked the man, and he said, yeah, unfortunately, the, all of the lost and found items go to the front desk. I was like, oh, fine, that's fine, okay. So I was, I was, I was ready to pay the unfortunate price of, what, $50, $60, $70 for this, for this charging brick. I was going to pay that price. But then on Friday, yesterday, at the Hinsdale Public Library to finish my sermon, I said, let me try one more time. There was a new receptionist. And the receptionist uh, looked at me and said, how can I help you, sir? And I said, I lost a charging brick this past Tuesday. I wonder, I, I'm just wondering, I'm check, I already checked before, I'm wondering if you have it. And she opened that same, she pulled out that same box of small appliances, and guess what? It wasn't in there. But she said, hold on. She went... Uh, she went underneath the table and she pulled out this brick and she said, Tuesday, right? Yeah, April 9th. Quiet room, April 9th, 2024. I said, how did you find it? That's mine. That's exactly it. How did you find this? Well, she said, you know, I, I actually looked, I opened, I had to look under the sweaters there are some here who feel like, yeah, Jesus is seeking after me, but I think he's given up on me because I've been too much of an outcast in my life. He's not going to go, he's not going to keep searching for me. He's not going to go underneath the sweater and the exterior later. He's not going to keep getting his hands dirty for me. I want to tell you that today salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. Verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Like the receptionist yesterday who went the extra mile for me, your Savior has already gone the extra mile for you to find you. And my question for you is this, as we close with these last two verses, and our praise team is going to come up and they're going to sing for us. As you read these two verses, I have a question after I read these two verses and then I'm finished. Verses 5 and 6 says this, Luke 19. When Jesus reached the spot 
he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him because he had to. Nope. The text says it uses the adverb gladly in the New International Version. He did it with joy. It was not a duty to welcome the Messiah into his home. It was a privilege and a delight. And friend, I have two invitations. One, as I am reading and thinking and reflecting on how I am being shaped and formed, I do worry that many of us as believers who proclaim that we are believers in the Messiah, that we are missing out on the rich privilege of hitting the pause button, of stopping, of being silent before the Savior. I like alliteration, right? And being in solitude to simmer in the sizzle of the Savior. I'm just making it up right now. But you get the picture. It's not, not to stop and read Scripture because I have to and it's a duty and because my church leaders and my family tells me I have to, but because it's a delight. So my invitation is that you would join me, those of you watching online, that you would join me that you would join many of us here who find it a privilege to carve out time to sit before the Messiah and to be exposed to the unconditional love love of God through Jesus Christ and his word. But here's my second invitation. Is there someone here, those of you watching online, there may be someone here, you feel like Zacchaeus. And you know what God is saying today? You can climb down that tree. Welcome me into your home. And I promise you, it's the best decision you'll ever make. You've left, welcome him in. You've never had him in your life, welcome him in. He's amazing. He loves us. We're going to sing about his love. So if you want to decide, let us know in the connect card in the pew in front of you. We have a connect card on the screen, QR code, website, let us know. Those of you here, you can drop off your connect card with the tithes and offerings. Let's follow the lamb wherever he goes because of his great love. Hallelujah. Let's sing about his love today.